welcome to Clock Talk. I am Crystal. This wonderful Tuesday morning, we're going to talk about sexuality, my favorite topic, <laughs> women and sexuality, and even better, women and sexuality in Shakespeare. And within that, my favorite, favorite Shakespeare play of all time, A Midsummer Night's Dream. So, wow, I can't wait to start this topic with a wonderful creative, just full of zest of life, uh, director of HPU Theater. Welcome, my lovely guest, Eden Lee Murray. Thank you so much, Crystal. I'm glad to be here. So I didn't properly uh, introduce you with the title. It is actually the Paul N. V. Lou Theater that you uh, are ahead of, correct? It's, a, it's actually a two-pronged title. I'm the adjunct professor of theater at HPU. Okay. And, and along with that comes the responsibility of being director of productions at the Paul N. V. Lou Theater up there. Ah, OK. But theater people aren't supposed to be responsible. They were supposed to be able to just go out there and... We just multitask. Oh, well, that's <laughs> a good thing to know. All right, so wonderful. Um, given that background, you're going to be doing a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream with your youth ensemble. Now, before we get into all that nice details of the upcoming production, let's dive right into Shakespeare. Let's dive right into A Midsummer Night's Dream and its exploration on women and sexuality. Do you have any opening statement on that one? Because it is a it is a very feminine play, don't you think? With a forest, well, a metaphor of the forest. Well, certainly, definitely centers around the battle between the sexes. You've got Oberon and Titania who are quarreling over the the possession of this little changeling boy. Right. And Oberon cheats to win. Yes. Um, Titania doesn't have a chance. She really doesn't. And once he gets his way, he takes the spell off and brings her back into reality after she's had a fairly extended. X-rated date with a monster, the, a beast. the ass-headed bottom, or that sounds kind of funny, but bottom who is enchanted by Puck, who's the, the minion of Oberon, right. who puts a monster's head on Titania, and Oberon tricks her to fall in love with the ass to humiliate her and gets the boy away from her, and then he lets her go back to being herself. Right. But, but the concept of a, of a fairy queen making love to a beast is very raw and sexual. It's very raw and sexual, and something that a lot of directors don't touch is the fact uh -huh. that big ears is not the only thing asses have. <laughs> and there's, one, uh, there's a moment they when They don't say that in the play, though, unless there's an underlying... There is an explicit piece oh. in the text where he, he me thought I was... Oh. Me thought I had, and then he reaches up to where the ears used to be. Me thought I had, and it totally supports a look in the southern hemisphere. At which point, then he goes, "No man would be crazy if what I thought I had." <laughs> but that's exactly, it's explicitly ah, what he's referring to. Shakespeare is so brilliant with the whole underlying oh, messages yeah. and everything. Yep, yep, yep. And there are just there's one innuendo after another right yeah. through this play and the way when I was teaching um, the way to get kids to do a close read of the play is say you find every dirty joke in the play <laughs> and they would come back and they would find there's that there's that there's that there's that also oh, give me a few let's, let's for people who don't know Midsummer Night's Dream let's talk about the dirty jokes in it well there's one uh, it's sort of a date joke where uh, Lysander and um, Lysander and Hermia have run off into the forest should we give a quick nutshell of the story Oh, gosh. For people who just don't know this Not play, which you should story. really see and read. It, it opens with the battle between the fairies, okay. Oberon and Titania. And then there are sort of interchangeable lovers, Hermia, Lysander, Demetrius, and Helena. Hermia and Lysander are in love. They want to marry. But Hermia's father, for some reason which is never explained, will not let her marry Lysander. Okay. He wants her to marry Demetrius. Okay. Demetrius and Helena have been a very happy couple until the play begins. Until and they so swap. Well, and then all of a sudden, Demetrius is supposed to marry Hermia. So two guys. He wants to marry Hermia because his, the father says he should, and Lysander wants to marry Hermia because they're in love. Right. Meanwhile, Helen is the one that's out in the cold. Right. So we have Hermia and Lysander who decide they're going to run away. They have to go through the enchanted forest. Unbeknownst to them, there's the war of the fairies going on and all kinds of and enchantments the on the loose. Right. right. And then Helena decides she's going to tell Demetrius that his intended is run off with the other guy yeah. so that he'll go into the forest and maybe something, maybe he'll have the same kind of change of heart with Hermia that he had with Helena and he'll come back to her. Right. So that's the basic setup. Yeah, yeah. And then the fairies, while, um, while Oberon is trying to figure out how to cheat and enchant Titania to get the boy that he wants away, yeah. he sees these lovers squabbling in the forest and tells Puck to take a piece of the magic flower that's going to enchant Titania. Anytime mm -hmm. 
when you put the flower in someone's eyes, any, the next thing they look on is what you fall in love with. Right. Makes right. no sense that's, at all. That's so, a good classic kind of a. So setup. in the he picks up one little stalk of that flower and tells Puck, his henchman, to go and squeeze the juice in the lover's eye that looks like he's dissing one of the girls. Right. Well, it all messes up, so and the wrong the lover wrong sees people, the wrong basically. girl. Right. And it's right. a terrible mess. Yeah. And then they make As it. Life is. They, right. right. And then they make it all come out better in the woods. They all fall asleep. Puck puts them to sleep. The angry father comes through with the Duke Theseus. There's another happy oh, yes. couple getting married, well, Theseus and Hippolyta. Are they happy? Yeah. Well, Theseus is happy. Hippolyta is the Amazon who kind yeah, of got. Yeah, isn't she the queen of the Amazons? Queen of the Amazons who got subjugated. And you see, she's not that happy. She's not that happy you either. You're quite okay. right. But they come hunting through the forest and they see the four lovers enchanted on the ground. And then the lovers wake up and they've been undone. They've been The antidote has been squeezed into their eyes. The right person sees the right person. They fall in love. And Theseus says, shut up, Aegeus. We're all going to get married. Right. At which point, and then there's the last skein of it, which is the rude mechanicals, this adorable band. Bottom is one of them. The guy yes. the you mean the play within the play? The play within uh -huh. the play. The rude mechanicals that have decided, and it's the epitome of a really bad community I theater. I love it. Oh, <laughs> it's so it's true. fabulous. Pyramus They've and been rehearsing in the Enchanted yes, Wood yes. to do a play that's going to be selected to perform in honor of the Duke's wedding. I love it. And though. they get it's picked. It's so tacky, right? Their whole setup. It's hard. And the thing about that play, I, I, when I was doing, um, I've seen this play and I've done this play off-Broadway. and. Yeah. and the only thing that can really go wrong with it is if the rude mechanicals are too good. I saw it on in the London oh, stage, I see. Okay. and the rude mechan the play was brilliant up until the end, and then they just knew okay. what they were doing with comedy, and right. it wasn't funny. Right. Like, oh, that's the key of comedy, though. You don't the, try too hard. You don't know you're funny. But the funniest, right. the funniest production of this I ever saw was in a freshman class at Kaimuki High School and their oh. Shakespeare Festival. I ran that for seven years, and this, this group of kids comes up, uh -huh. and they're terrified. And, and Thisbe, the guy Making playing Thisbe, the had oh, balloons, oh, balloons, okay. and the balloons. <laughs> had a life of their own and the right. kid was mortified because he couldn't get them to hold still and That's his wig fell off of and it. he tripped and he was That's just almost in tears. Yeah, I said, yeah, you yeah. kiss the feet of the god of comedy yeah. because that yeah. and the people natural. were weeping. They I were laughing it. so hard and that's now, what we're that, for. Now that we're on Pyramus and Thisbe, this uh, historically is an all-male group, yes? Yeah. So in the play within the play, there are men playing, including the one who plays the girl with the fake boobs, but in old Shakespeare, it was always men playing. Yeah. Women were not allowed on stage. So how does that reflect on, on the interpretation of women when it's always been cast by men to play even the women? That's a great question. Um, the ones in Shakespeare's companies that played the women were generally the boys whose voices hadn't changed yet. Oh. And there might have been some ambivalent sexuality going on there. Uh -huh. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. um, um, I'm not sure. People just take for granted. They yeah, just take it for it's granted. Just yeah, and in our company, yeah. there are more girls than there are guys, so okay. some of the girls ah, are flipping over and playing men. Right. Now, in our case, Thisbe is being played by a guy, right. as is Bottom. Well, That's you were saying something about. before we came on air. It was very interesting about the concept of the fairies, that they are not gendered in a way. They're not. Well, here's, okay, okay. Again, again, I was telling you at the beginning yeah. that um, I generally cre evolve the interpretation of a play depending on the company that I inherit from auditions across Oahu. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I have a, a very small company because I moved it from the Hawaii Theater when I left Hawaii Theater last semester, last oh, summer, okay. um, to take the job as the adjunct professor up at, uh, at HBU. HBU. Right. And what I did, because the parents of these kids had said, wherever you go, we're coming with you, Aww. which is really lovely. Yes. So I have of 20, 25 that were in the company last year, some aged out, some left island, and I wound up with 15, okay. which is a fairly small yes. company. So what we did was we decided we were going to run with the concept of a band of fairies that descend upon the HPU theater. They come in during the pre-show in real time. They set the stage. They discover this stuff. They create it, what they're going to work with. They come in. The fairies tend to pilfer. If you, We've done a lot of research on fairies for this. And they steal from mortals. And they don't have a particularly high regard for mortals. So they've come in. Why? To, well, well, because we're just fat, dumb, and slow. <laughs> and they work at a much higher frequency than we do. So okay. we, we're, we're, they are superior at least certainly in their minds. So yeah. they come in to play this story that shows how stupid the mortals are, from the rude mechanicals to the lovers who, fairies, just, fairies are just so sensual and sexual, and it's not a big deal, right? Yes. But the, but the lovers, for example, Lysander yeah. and Hermia, when they run off in the wood, Lys Hermia says, I'm so tired, and so she falls down, and Lysander tries to spoon and just come right up behind her. She goes, no, 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 not now. We're not married. No, mm -mm. You go over there. And this goes crazy. back to the, the, the traditional, right? The yeah. whole repressed kind of sexuality that's bound. Well, virginity was at a, pro at a premium, you know, so she's not going to sleep with him until she's married. Well, the fairies think that's ridiculous. So the fairies, if you're going to interpret that today, are very progressive. 
They're um, just freeing. They're just free. For, yeah. They're sensual. If they want it, they do it. So is there something for us to learn, us, us dumb mortals of, I from fairies? I don't know. I don't know because in the course of our story, because right about halfway through the play, one of the, more, one of the fairies just howls, Lord, what fools these mortals be. That's right? like the key. Because the the, that's at the crux of the mess up in the forest, right? <laughs> and then after that, each of, each of the fairies playing the mortals has to go through the crisis of the play for each one of those characters. Mm -hmm. and one of the beauties of theater is that it teaches empathy and what I'm watching the fairies hmm. go through is as they incarnate these characters as as they tell the story they all of a sudden begin to get a sense of what it feels like to be mortal. So do you think as the teens in this ensemble in the process of of being so involved in the play as the fairies looking down on the mortals that they learn about human nature and sexuality are they are they picking up those? I think they're doing just fine learning about sexuality without on their the own. play <laughs> right yeah but <laughs> in too. terms of what I one this this play for me is a box in a box one of the reasons I love working with students and children in theater mm -hmm. is because when you stand in someone else's shoes when you have to learn how someone else feels you can no longer judge them hmm. I mean when I was working in New York and publishing a long time ago I was also doing theater at night um, and wow. somebody was explaining to me the behavior of somebody that they didn't like, and I said, oh, well, that's probably because blah, blah, blah. And I was trying to look for the, what's underneath the presenting behavior. Right. And this woman looked at me and said, oh, spoken like an actress. And at the uh -huh. time, I thought it was a slam. I thought uh -huh. she was putting me down for right. that. Right. And I asked her about it years later when we were friends, and she said, oh, no, no, no. I was amazed, because all I had done was to evaluate what I saw, and what was hitting me in the face. Mm. And you went underneath to see what was what was behind mm. what that person was presenting and to try and understand that. Right. And she says, I thought that was remarkable. And that's, I see that happen with children over and over and over again when they play in And theater. that's a really interesting way to channel um, teen issues. I mean, a lot of people don't know with the social media, in fact, we're going to talk about that next week, is the, you know, all the consequences of all that and how lack of communicative we've become. Oh, and the social media and stuff where you can be anonymous. Yes. That's that, that, and the whole, you know, the, the old fashioned the concept image. of the pecking party mm. where you've got a bunch of birds together and yeah. nobody knows who's going to be the victim, who's going to be the boss until somebody pecks and there's one drop of blood drawn uh. and it turns into a pecking party. And whoever is blooded first, the rest of them jump mm. down and attack. Yeah. You know, scary human and, nature. In and that with way. social media, it's the anonymity of it. You, you Everybody's disconnected. Yes, um, yes, no one to blame. Right. Oh, and in theater, there. you're right there. Yes. Face to face, you yes. have to and deal. you're touching and feeling. So the texture and coming in terms with your body. Right. Let's talk about the body and how um, a youth kind of um, learns to explore the body through theater and well, sexuality and sensuality. True, and for our fairies, because each one of the kids in the company has had to create, before they even touched the Shakespeare characters, uh -huh. they had to begin to learn right. how to move like a fairy. Yeah. And what, how what, does a fairy move? Depends on what they're connected with in nature. Ah, like the so tree fairies like have one kind oh, of motion. Okay. The, we've got one fairy whose name is Zug, because they Zug. all had to come up with their own names. And this is a fairy of mud. And she's just... A <laughs> fairy of mud. I love right? it. Wait, and so they, they choose their own connection to whatever aspect of nature. Yep. I love and then, it. And then some, for example, the, the guy who plays, uh, for us in the Rude Mechanical, is the stupidest, the slowest, <laughs> well, the slowest... <laughs> The dimmest bulb in the chandelier, and he's right. just adorable. He's playing. We had to combine two characters. He plays Snaug, who is the lion in the wall. Right. And he, he's his fairy is named Hellas, and he's a fairy of the sun, and he's of superior intelligence. Oh. And so his fairy chose to play the dimmest bulb just because he could really <laughs> laugh at him. Ah. And even at the end, as he comes out and he makes his case as the lion for the court, you see the fairy working to make him good. So the fair, all of the fairies, again, and okay. one, one child asked me yesterday at rehearsal, she said, well, when, if we're, because I've asked them all to play it, a hyper-reality. I said, I don't, want, I don't want soap opera acting. I don't want yeah. good, real acting. I want to see fairies playing and having fun with how they think mortal lovers behave, right? How do mortal lovers behave on behalf of a, a perspective of a fairy? Well, you know, we're just going to have to think about this. Take a quick breather break. Think about your fairy self and how you <laughs> see your mortal self and how we can improve our sexuality. Come back and talk more about Midsummer Night's Dream. Aloha. I'm Kawi Lucas host of Hawaii is my mainland every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here and my past blogs can be found at kawilucas.com. Okay. <laughs> 
I didn't listen. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you could talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Back here on Quack Talk, I'm Crystal here with lovely Ian Lee talking about A Midsummer's Dream and how sexuality is played out through the fairies and the mortals. Now, let's talk about the forest, you know, because the metaphor of the forest is very sexual if you want to interpret, if you want to go down there. You know, <laughs> it's where people go, you see. She, she already, like, interpreted it the way she wanted to. No, but really, on a, even on the psychoanalysis side of things, if you want to talk about repression and the idea of a man's anxiety and, and the fear of the woman's sexuality, I mean, there's so many layers we can talk about. Well, again, and the thing is, because it's an enchanted forest, yes. it's the forest where everyone can do what they want. You know, so there are no rules. There are no rules. All, all, no, all bets are off, right? So, and and the uh, that which is that which is constraining you in society, for example, Hermia, Lysander, Demetrius, and Helena have rules they have to yes. obey in Athens, but they and go in the relate. forest. All bets are off, uh -huh. and and uh, what that which is up goes down. That which is down goes up. That which you thought you understood is completely overthrown. Um, is that kind of like the gate to everybody's dream and desire, where they kind of want to unleash but don't want dare to speak of it can in the conscious that. world? It's also like Joseph Campbell's uh, on a hero's journey. It, it's mm -hmm. uh, it sort of pulls the hero's journey inside out. Joseph Campbell believes it, and e any one of these characters you could imagine as as their own the hero of their mm -hmm. own story. But each one has uh, you start with a point of stasis where the life the life is grounded, and then the world tilts, mm -hmm. and the hero has to go into the underworld learn a lesson, go on a journey, meet his helpers, etc., and then return to his world changed, changed, bettered, understanding something, learning something. Well, in this case, everybody in the play learns something, and they come back. They, the, the lovers who belong together are together. Aegeus, who is the controlling father, who all of a sudden yeah, has to, and he has a moment of reconciliation in the forest with his daughter and with Lysander, who mm. he said some pretty rotten things about. But in, in our production, everybody goes through their journey and then reconciles and then we have the, have the wedding and the play within a play which right. is just delicious but while funny. they're in the forest and all this juicy kind of s couple swapping and jealousy and what they do to to show the partner what they think they will affect them i mean all these interpretations do you think shakespeare really has this concept of the forest as being this 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 sexual energy that's released somehow i'm sure that's one way that's one way to look at it you know, I mean, there's, there's so many ways you can interpret. That's the beauty of Shakespeare. Yes. It's so broad. It's what about people saying that Shakespeare is gay? Who cares? Well, because uh, there's a lot I've of gender heard. issues uh -huh. that are interpreted through Shakespeare plays. Right. Or maybe that's just because we trying to pick out little stupid, you know, weeds out of the garden. Well, no, you, you can run with that. You, there's also the, the whole school of thought that don't, that, that don't believe Shakespeare or Shakespeare <laughs> of Stratford-on-Avon was the one who wrote the plays. Right, right. I did a production of um, Much Ado About Nothing a couple of years ago from an Oxfordian point of view, which mm. is the idea that the 17th Earl of Oxford is the one who um, wrote the plays. Do you, I mean, are, do you familiar with that? With mm. that? Okay, so Oxford was this brilliant child, uh, very precocious. Elizabeth met him when she was on one of her progressions oh. through love through England uh -huh. when he was about eight, maybe maybe that. He spoke Latin, he spoke Greek, he could do poetry. He was just brilliant, and so mm -hmm. she fastened her eyes on him and kept her eyes on him. And when he was about 13, 14, she brought him to her palace to be her minister of the ewer, which meant he poured her bath water. And when he was 15 years old, she took his virginity. And they were lovers for a very, throughout her life and his, right? And he wanted very much to be, um, he wanted to be acknowledged at least as her lover, if not made her partner, right? And she refused to do it. And they would have periodically these knockdown, drag out fights. Uh -huh. and in a couple of play, couple of times it was argued that he went too far and she was going to oh. either execute him or take his lands oh. or his title or whatever so he had to quickly write a play oh. to apologize oh, and the, I, uh, the, our contention was that much ado about nothing was that play oh. and that she had to come in and it's about Beatrice and Benedict and the squabbles and a romantic You see there's writing. always a backstory to every drama right, and right, that's right. the most interesting thing well, like a prequel. So what I'm saying is I, I, you could go and we, we yeah. created a whole interpretation of a play around well Oxford was, was actually 
actually Shakespeare. Ah. So when you say, was Shakespeare actually okay, gay, right. I'm wondering huh. how that would affect um, a take on Midsummer because there's nobody... No, that it's issue not doesn't that type surface. Of identity right. It's very, it's very heterosexual yeah. play. Right. <laughs> well, if anything, I think it's quite um, patriarchal, if you will, because it's really they come from this kind of a dominating. The king speaks, right. and the men know, win. And then right, and then the women have to find some ways to go around and and explore their own sexuality on their own terms, and then go back to deal with going back to the husband, and 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 you know, it's it's still it's it's very. Well, we also, sure. that's funny, too, because while, while um, Oberon is thinking he's humiliating Titania by giving her this monster to be in love with for, right. or to be in bed with for right, right. a 24-hour period, when in fact she's she just had a it. plenty good time. Yeah. And what, what, there's some, Titania. Sometimes a traditional interpretation of when, when Oberon breaks the spell and wakes her up is she turns around and goes, <gasps> he goes, you know, there lies your, she goes, well, he thought I was in the moment of an ass. And he goes, there lies your love. And she goes, ah, right? right. In ours, she says, <laughs> and she just bursts out laughing, like, you, you. Do you see? And she, then Oberon is like a moment of, you're mine now. Right? Yeah, come yeah. back to me, woman, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. there's in there, one of my favorite quotes in there was something about how Titania says, man is but ass if he goes about to expound his dream. That's bottom's line. Bottom's line. Man ah. is but an ass. He's talking about when he wakes up in the forest and the head is gone and he's back to being himself. And he's talking about what he's seen. But, and he just, man is but an ass if he thinks, I can't remember the line, the whole To line. go about to expound your dream. So does that mean that we shouldn't be over-interpreting our dreams and just let it let us enjoy that release? Well, no, because the next thing he does is hop up and run over to Peter Quince's house. His director, he's I'll have Peter Quince can write a song about it, and it'll be called Bottom's Dream, <laughs> because it has no bottom. I mean, he's, he's, he just doesn't think he has the capacity to do it, so right. he goes off to his boss. Oh, you know. It's like the scarecrow Wizard of Oz who thinks he doesn't have a brain, but exactly. he's brilliant. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't, I might we go as far as to say <laughs> okay. that Bottom is brilliant, right. but the boy playing Bottom is just deliciously oh, funny. Good. Because so let's talk a little bit about that, your play. Oh, well, all right. Um, the play, the, the, as I said, the concept is these, these fairies come into, the, come into the space, they discover the space, they filch costumes from wherever, they fight over who's going to play what role, who's going to, and then... Um, What's really beautiful is we borrowed the language that Tony Pisculli, when he, he of the Hawaii Shakespeare Festival last year, did a production of Midsummer with invented languages. The Greeks, the mortals, spoke one language. It was called Greekish, and okay. the fairies spoke the other. Great. I played Aegeus, and I mean, I, it took me forever to learn it, but it was in iambic pentameter, and it, it, it was so much fun. But the fairyish had a different language entirely, and I borrowed, with Tony's permission, the fairies come into the theater speaking that language, and they mess with the audience speaking that language. And how do the fairies speak, and, please? Oh, I don't speak fairy. Oh, sorry, I speak. But you work with them. You must know a little bit of their I language. I gave them the language, and they do. It sounds like uh -uh. gersh blarge, right? It's very er. It's okay. very earthy. It's very sensual, very sexual, if you want. Okay. And then the fairy, they actually, they get everything set, and there's a, the pre-show, I want people to come as close to a half hour before the curtain oh. as possible, because the pre-show happens in real ah. time. And then the show begins. That's when they're exploring the mortals. That's when they're exploring okay. the mortals in the audience, and setting themselves up, and how am I going to play this part, etc. And then the fairies disappear, the music begins, the lights come up, Theseus and Hippolyta come, and they're speaking fairyish. I love it. And all the fairies come back onto the stage, and they look at the audience, and they realize, <laughs> so they have to cast a spell, and they, I won't say what they do, but they okay. do cast a spell, and then they disappear, and we replay at the very beginning of the play, Theseus and Apollo come in, and the audience can understand them. You know, Italy, you, you were just <laughs> revealing a little taste of the magic of this production. I mean, the play itself is so magical, but you've just had just shown us a little inkling of it. Tell us more. Um, so this upcoming production is next week. You've been working on this for quite a long we opened, time now. We've been, we've been working with the play since January. Uh -huh. um, the kids have completely internalized their fairies. That's fabulous. And the fairies are in the process now of last steps of internalizing the so characters. So they live and breathe fairy. They live and breathe fairy, and then the fairy brings the character to life. Okay, and then so it's next week. It's this Friday. This Friday, oh, oh, wow. May yeah. 12th at 7.30, May 13th, Saturday at 7.30. Please come about a half an hour early. The doors open a half hour before the curtain time of the show. And on Sunday at 4, we close with You should have May. tricked them and wrote, instead of 7.30 actual time, you say 7 o'clock, because then people will come. Then, you know? yeah, well, it's I, a fairy trick. It's a meow, yeah, no, because the people who show up feel like they, oh. they see people come in just before the curtain, and the ones in the audience are the ones in the know. 
Ah. So they have seen the goodies. What are some tips to, uh, going back to the fairy mortal world, for us to leave with the takeaway of, you know, what we're missing as, as earthly creatures um, in terms of just our outlook on love and life? What can we learn from the fairies? What can we learn from the fairies? What can the fairies learn from us? Ah, okay, let's start with that I one I would then. say, because oh. the fairies come in with the prejudice. Ah. And I think the fairies, through the process of living what mortals live, leave the theater kinder, gentler sorts. And I think if the audience takes anything away from that, it's like, you know, you don't, don't make fun until you understand. Mm. Um, and I think... Um, I would have thought the mortals were more judgmental. And that's really interesting that you've put it as the fairies having the preconception. Yep, I wanted to flip the box. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, would you say that um, this is a good production for youths, for all ages? What, oh, I, what, I would what? have to go with the riot of fun for young and old. And the thing, the thing that I love about it, about working like this with this, it makes me think of what um, George Bernard Shaw said. And he said, if you, if you use theater to try and teach people things, you will drive people from the theater in hordes. Hmm. If you use the theater to entertain, to amuse, to delight, you can teach people anything you want. What is your favorite quote or scene or moment in A Midsummer Night's Dream? Give me your hands if we be friends, and Robin will restore amends. And that line is, that line, actually the audience doesn't hear that line because two lines before, well the line before those two lines, huh, the fairies take their spell back and the whole company speaks that last line in fairyish. Fairyish. Yeah. Again, the language that you're not going to share with us. I can't. I don't speak. <laughs> I speak Greekish. I don't speak fairyish. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to reinterpret this yourself in whatever way you want. Um, again, it is this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at HPU. Yep. Um, there's a huge world of fairs out there that people don't really know exist, but to find that fairy world within your world. Does that make sense? Sure, yes? absolutely. And to come with an open mind, with, with the freedom to explore and to touch with the other side. There's I love magic it. everywhere. Yeah, that's wow. What, that's what I leave with. There's magic everywhere. Magic everywhere. Okay, but you know, I still say that people have a weird concept that magic is not, it doesn't touch me. This is something, oh, it's play. Right. How do we get them to feel that? How, how do we transfer that magic? Well, interestingly enough, when people go to see live theater, they are opening their mind to magic. Okay. You know, I, I tell my kids when. So they need to go. They need. They need to go. When you. When people <laughs> okay. come through a door to theater, they are five years old. I don't care how old they are chronologically. Lovely. They come in going, "Tell me a story," and we give them that. And boy, do we have a story! <laughs> so please go and see this magical, magical performance. Thank you, Eden Lee, Thank for you so such much. a wonderful interpretation of that world. Thank and you, don't, 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 just go see it. All right. Meet someone <laughs> in the street this weekend. Thank you.